So hello, everyone. Hello. Hello, great. I think we can all hear each other. So hi, everyone. My name is Joy Mboya, and I'll be moderating this discussion, which I believe should be an exciting one. So welcome to Resiliat Kenya. This is a digital platform of virtual debates and discussions that involves stakeholders from the cultural and creative industries. And this is the very first discussion we're having and we'll be looking at resilience and sustainability in the creative economy in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, I'd like to first of all just mention that this event is hosted under the auspices of UNESCO and in partnership with the Department of Culture in the Ministry of Sports, Culture and Heritage, in partnership also with the Kenya National Commission for UNESCO, as well as the Creative Economy Working Group, Tuaweza Communications, Alliance Francaise and the Godin Art Center. But to start off, I'd like to welcome and invite and thank the UNESCO Director, uh, the Regional Office for Eastern Africa, uh, Ms. Anne Therese Ndong Jata, uh, to invite her to make some opening remarks. Karibu sana, uh, Madam Ndong Jata. Okay, thank you very, very much. Um, let me just start my video. Like I said earlier, I had a little bit of a problem with the internet and I pray that um, it does not go off again. Uh, good afternoon to all of you, um, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, and all the partners working with us. Uh, let me start first and foremost by uh, wishing you all a happy World Day of Cultural Diversity. We couldn't have chosen a better day for this event. Um, thank you for chairing, uh, Madam Chair. I can see from your face that really, this is where we find joy. It is an, it is an honor for me to welcome you to the Resilient Kenya debate, whose theme is crafting and reshaping the creative economy for resilience and sustainability in the context of COVID-19. On a day when uh, the whole world celebrates the UN World Day for Cultural Diversity for Dialogue and Development. And just for your information, um, you are not alone in this. The thoughts you've just expressed um, are really also one that others in other countries all over the world, and today in particular, we have two other countries in our region um, really engage in the same debate. As we all know, COVID-19 has become a, a real severe pandemic beyond the initial reflections and um, discussions. Um, yes, there has been panic, but it doesn't seem from the narrative that it is going to go away very soon. And therefore the need for us to continue to reflect together on how to mobilize differently uh, to respond to what is anticipated as a new norm. But we know this has posed many serious challenges across the globe. It's really uh, one that in our lifetime, we've never heard or experienced before. The lockdown measures taken to contain the pandemic have hit all sectors of government and the culture and culture in particular. And the reason why um, one would feel it even more within the culture sector is as you all know, most of your, um, you know, and those engaged artists in the sector are more in the informal sector than in the formal sector. And therefore would not necessarily um, be part of a monthly, um, uh, salary. Uh, that therefore explains why when one says um, COVID-19 has hit the, the culture sector really hard, um, it is very, very much uh, understandable. The crisis is critical for the cultural and creative sector due to the sudden and massive loss of revenue opportunities, uh, which you have alluded to. Um, in your initial remark, which affects both large corporations as well as small creative entrepreneurs and freelance professionals. 
This has threatened the livelihoods of local communities and cultural professionals. Cultural institutions and facilities, including festivals, theaters, cinemas, are losing millions in revenue each day. And many have had to downsize. The pandemic has impacted the entire creative value chain, creation, uh, production, distribution, and access, and considerably weakened the professional, social, uh, economic status of artists and cultural professionals. This indeed, um, one could also say, is not just a health crisis or emergency. COVID-19 is indeed a cultural emergency. And with that, therefore, what are our thoughts? What can we think of innovatively to begin to make the adjustments that all other sectors have also to embark upon? It is clear that during difficult times such as these, the world in general, as a whole. And it's important to always um, look at it from the global picture. The world needs culture and creative arts more than ever. And that's why I started by saying, just looking at your face tells us where joy is, because no matter how hard hit um, artists may be, they can always be able to bring some sunshine. The music we've just listened to is so soothing. And so therefore, we know that the world needs culture and the creative arts more than ever before. The arts provide comfort, inspiration, and hope at a time of anxiety and uncertainty. Some of the artists you would have heard were very much mobilized in conveying the messages in different forms, be it um, through poetry or music or just drama. And so therefore the world turns to you. In Kenya, the sector has registered massive loss of revenue as a result of abrupt cancellations of events, festivals, concerts, etc. Numerous artists and create and um, are unable to make ends meet, much less produce new works of art during these strenuous times. But I would really say, rather than just lament about what COVID has created, let's become a little bit more innovative. Let's think positively, because when we look back, we never can move forward. But when we are able to begin to look at how to overcome challenges, it helps us probably to move ahead. And I believe if there's a message I want to leave, it's a message of hope and hope that only you can create because over the years, challenges have hit different sectors of society, the culture sector, no doubt. But as I mentioned earlier, we look to culture. We look to the culture sector. We look to the artists to really begin to imagine or reimagine how to really continue during this period and this pandemic, which we have been told, I said from the narrative, it's not one that's going away too soon. So what do we do? And I hope this debate will reflect on what can be done for the recovery of the creative, creative sector in the context where the COVID-19 pandemic remains a major threat to global health. Cultural activities that may soon resume must find ways of dealing with constraints that will have um, significant social and financial impacts. Therefore, providing space to discuss these challenges and collectively seek solutions with stakeholders drawn from various government agencies civil society representing various subsectors in the creative economy to make recommendations for the resilience of the sector is in my view crucial and vital at this point this is precisely why unesco 
launched the Resili Art Movement, which aims to discuss the ramifications of COVID-19 on the creative economy, share information and support while building solidarity and resilience in the culture sector. It's one that, like I say, and I want to repeat, if there is a sector of um, the economy that can bounce back, it should be the culture sector, because this is the sector that is known first and foremost for innovativeness. So rather than really uh, bury your heads uh, into the sun, thinking that the end has come, look at ways during your reflections to consider how to bounce back and bounce back differently because we are all supposed to face a new norm. We hope that through this resilient Kenya debate, we can raise awareness of the far reaching impact of the current confinement measures on the culture sector. Work closely with government, civil society organizations and cultural practitioners and stakeholders Will ex would help to explore ways the sector can navigate this period economically, socially, emotionally, and mitigate the current crisis and forecast for a better future. As I close, um, I would like to applaud the president of Kenya and the government for recognizing the challenge creative practitioners are facing and being one of the few and I should really underscore this, very few African states to pro proactively release a work for play in the, in the region of about 100 Kenyan shillings stimulus package for artists and actors and musicians as a way of cushioning those in the creative industry during the period of COVID-19 pandemic. And I believe um, like everything else, if we start appreciating the little efforts, it may help to amplify your voices and the need maybe to do more. But already by appreciating what the government has done, it's a way of also showing to the rest of the world that something can be done. Because while you're thinking of your own predicament, it's also important to consider your other uh, colleagues elsewhere that may be going through worse times with no recognition from government. These and other similar efforts demonstrate an active and agile leadership that is ready to play its part in alleviating the challenges brought by this crisis. And Kenya so far is doing very well in this direction, you know, not just in the cultural sector. It is also my distinct pleasure to thank the partners of this program as you have really referred to um, starting out, especially the Ministry of Sports, Culture and Heritage. I'm sure the ministry will come with great ideas. You know, the, you have a dynamic minister in the culture sector, and I'm sure uh, she's also um, thinking hard and deep on what to do. As the Kenya National Commission for UNESCO, um, there's Alliance Francaise, you have the Creative Economy Working Group, the Go Down Arts Center, and to our weather communications. I think all of you coming together, reflecting would really bear fruit. For working towards the realization of this program, I am sure that the, I'm just excited that even the thought of coming together like this um, could really lead us to some solutions and best practices that we can share with others. We also want to greatly appreciate all our distinguished panelists for taking time to participate in today's webinar. I will stay on, as I said to Judy, I know there will be fun, there will be great ideas, just to learn because in, for me, every occasion to listen to some other voice, to some other ideas, add to my own um, uh, development. And I, I believe, we need to be together to resolve the problems. We do not have the answers, but together we can find the solution. So I wish you all fruitful deliberation during this webinar. And um, should the internet connectivity stay on, I'll be with you 
for as long as I can. Thank you very much once again, Madam Chair, and thank you to the panelists. I'm here listening. Thank you very much and have a good evening. Now, thank you very much indeed. That is the Director of the UNESCO Regional Office for Eastern Africa, Ms. Anne Therese Ndong Jata, for those who might be joining us now. And thank you for setting the stage for us to have a discussion around the effects of this time and this moment on Kenya's creative e economy. So I understand that we have 93 attendees at the moment and some of us are on YouTube. And for those of you whose friends are not able to join us on Zoom, do encourage them to follow us on the YouTube channel as well. And then before I introduce the panelists to just uh, let you know that um, in the spirit of, of uh, supporting artists and, and, and sharing what we do and make, the music that you heard in the beginning um, was guitar music that um, is an arrangement and, and performance by um, Manasse Uzele, performing with Wandere Karimi, who is one of the panelists today, and Tom Olango. And we'd like to thank them for sharing that music with us. Okay, so now I'd like to introduce our panelists and we have discussants from various creative economy spheres. We have uh, discussants coming from cultural policy, resource mobilization. Um, we also have them coming from various subsectors of the creative economy, from music, from visual arts, from film, and we have expertise in intellectual property law as well. And I will introduce them briefly. And as I introduce you, um, I'll give you a chance to just say hello so that um, your little box will light up and the attendees can see who you are. So I'd uh, start by introducing uh, Dr. Kiprop Lagat, who is the director in the Department of Culture in the Ministry of Sports, Culture and Heritage. Hello, everybody. Very pleased to join you this evening for this discussion. Thank you. Karimi Sana. We also have Wanderi Karimi, who is the director of the Kenya Conservatory of Music and also a musician in her own right. Well, it's nice to be with you tonight. Uh, George Gashara, who is the managing partner at the Heva Fund, uh, is also with us this afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to see all of you. I'm happy to be here. And also uh, Maggie Otieno. Maggie is a sculptor and a creative entrepreneur. Hello, everyone. Looking forward to the great discussions. Thank you. Karibu, Maggie. Uh, Martin Munua is also with us. He's a filmmaker, and he's currently the chair of the Kenya Film and Television Professionals Association. Martin, are you there? Yes. Hi, all. Nice to meet you. and Nice to be here. Yeah, Sante. Uh, Mudoni Drama Queen, a singer, a rapper, a drummer and of course, a leading Kenyan musician, Karibu Sana. Hi, thanks for having me. Thank you. And then we're also joined by Nelmo Newsong, who is a recording and performing artist and founder of the Mukuru Festival. Hello, Nelmo. Yeah, I'm here. Ah, excellent. So welcome. So these uh, wonderful seven individuals are here to talk to us and talk with us not only about how the pandemic has affected us as artists and as, as creative and cultural practitioners and organizations, but I think especially to share how we are being adaptive, how we are being resourceful, how we are being resilient uh, and innovative in this time. You know, as they say, every cloud has a silver lining and we hope that some of these uh, resilient, adaptive, innovative ways um, will point the future uh, for a more resilient sector for us after this storm subsides. And we'll get right down to it. Um, we do know that we have, of course, uh, comments and questions that will come as the conversation progresses. So I will try my best to juggle receiving those and sharing them back to the panel. Uh, this, this, this technology is something that we will master very quickly, uh, trying to see how to speak to the camera, but also read the sidebar. And then we'll try and get a response to as many of these as we can. So do forgive us if we're not able to get to all of the questions but we will begin now. And we hope to go until about 5.30. So we know that one of the immediate effects of the pandemic has been to really reduce the capacity of artists to earn incomes. With the partial lockdown, and this has now been going for about two months now, with the daily evening curfews, um, we know that it's very difficult to go out to seek work. It's very difficult to get work. Um, and many of us are on a go slow, many of us are on a pause, 
Some of us have even been forced to stop projects and prospects that we had. So I want us with the panelists to just do a quick reflection on what this looks like from their own experience, some immediate impacts on yourself and on your sector. And I'd like to start with, um, with uh, Mudoni, the drama queen. Mudoni, I'd just like you to, to, to just share with us a primary income stream that for you um, was immediately affected by the current situation and to tell us how severe it is and, and what the effect has been, how you're coping. Um, thanks, Joy. So as a performer, one of the main income streams we have is live music performance. Um, and touring um, is a really big part of that because then that sort of gives you a block of predictable income. And a lot of the touring happens in Europe. So 2020 is cancelled for touring. Um, they're predicting that uh, touring and festivals don't come back in full effect until around fall of 2021. So next year, October, September is when things resume. So we're looking at more than 18 months um, of lack of um, that piece of income, touring income and, and live music income. And I think it's really difficult for artists across the board, right? So um, if you think that if Beyonce had a secret album she was going to drop this year and make a bunch of money on tour, she doesn't have it. So she's in exactly the same situation as um, a guitarist who plays two or three times uh, uh, gigs in a week at different um, venues or hotels or bars. So it's quite, it's quite dire. It's comforting that everybody is in the same boat, but are we really? I think bigger artists have possibly more reserve, more savings, um, and so are able to bridge the gap in the short run. But ours isn't a short run. Ours is really like, ours is long thing. I think, to be quite honest, live performances at scale at the level we're used to is probably going to be the very last thing that comes back on the plate after we go into a post-COVID world. So it's... It's dire, but I think it's going to get much more dire. Mm. Yeah, Mudoni, you mentioned that, of course, those, those artists who have had the um, opportunity to, to build up reserves, you know, probably have something to, to fall back on temporarily for now. Temporarily. Um, yeah, temporarily. And I just want to know, just a, a, a quick follow-up question. Um, live performances and touring are a primary source of income for you. What percentage of your own incomes does this represent? when you look at, you know, generally? Um, from my musician income, I'd say, not I'd say, it is about 60% of my primary income. Right, yeah, that's, that's, that's big, that's big. Uh, Martin, <laughs> I'll put the next question to you um, because you see that you, you also, of course, are a company. And so we, we're seeing that the pandemic, of course, is affecting um, artists as individuals, but also artists, businesses, companies. Um, yeah. Yeah. Now, what have you had to to do in terms of, of, of either downsizing or, or looking at expenditure at this time? What steps have you taken to keep the company going, your production company going? Well, we've been we have been faced with uh, several challenges, and um, this this one honestly, I didn't I don't think anyone saw it coming. So let me speak for myself. I didn't see it coming in the sense that. Um, when you look at overall and the setup of the company and the way it's structured, you've got a container full of equipment sitting somewhere. You've got the, the core team, which has taken me almost 10 years to put together. And I mean, 10 years is going through over 50 different guys, uh, finding that uh, unique team where I can finally sleep at night knowing in the morning, there'll be delivery, whether be it in terms of edits, be in terms of, sending someone to Accra to cover an event or something. So I finally felt I've gotten there. And for my age, who someone who's looking towards retirement and trying to reduce on work hours and all, I said, yay, I'm finally getting there. Now I can you know, meet with George, Joy, who, and, 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 and have coffee while work is ongoing. Um, all this has changed, all, all, all this has changed. So here I am thinking, what do I give up first? Do I give up the team? That's a human resource which I rely on really heavily. And as I say, it's taken me 10 years to put together. Then I've got 
the the space. Should I sell that equipment? But what if it, un, if it, if it unlocks in two, two months time? But again, who is going to go and buy equipment worth millions of shillings like right now? So I've got equipment sitting down in space that I'm paying rent, rental for. And then I've got the office where nobody's going there because of uh, social distancing. And uh, we, we've split ourselves in terms of all the editors are working from home and things like that. So we're working remotely relying heavily on the internet and uh, you know um, online meetings like Zoom meetings. But we've, we've, we've had to reorganize, we've had to renegotiate rental space, we've had to uh, talk with the team. Uh, and more than anything, which I think uh, I, I need to bring out is at the end of the day, we are all human with the same needs. Whether you're team leader or whether you're the cable pusher, we all strive for the basic needs, yeah? that's the bottom line of the Maslow's pyramid. How do you sit down as a team and tell guys, listen, in three months time, if we are still in this situation, we have to just break this family and hope it will be intact when things reopen up. Mm. So it's a, it's, a, it's a very difficult space we find ourselves in from a company point of view. Then I can discuss a uh, film much later on after questions come. Yes, no, absolutely, absolutely. Because I, I think that we're seeing, of course, when you look at the effect of the pandemic in, in, in other countries as well, where it's even worse than here, if you're looking at the pandemic in the UK and in, in, in the US, um, some arts organizations have had to fold all together, a complete shutdown, a complete stop, stoppage, I think, as you're saying, Martin, of a lifetime's work. And that is actually very, very serious indeed. But Maggie, I'd like to put this next question to you, Maggie Otieno. Um, who is coming in from the visual arts side? I think, of course, you know the one of the first things that 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 you know that that we that we the feel the pain of is the the economic constraints that COVID nineteen has brought. But apart from money, there's a lot of anxiety, um, a lot of stress that the moment of uncertainty, of course, has has caused. Um, social isolation when we cannot reach out, meet with people who give us um, security and comfort. Please describe the mood that you're seeing in the visual arts sector in particular. Um, what are you seeing in terms of just mental well-being, um, psychological health in this in 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 the space that you work in? Uh, thanks, Joy. Um, I think uh, the the pandemic has really hit the visual arts sector hard, and uh, I think for a very long time as a visual artist, we've never been. In, uh, keeping reserves very well and uh, this this kind of time is showing us that we really must start thinking about this and I've just been uh, taking a, a walk in some of the centers I was at uh, Masai Mbili last week and the place was really quiet I found only two artists there Mbutia and another guy and I've been to Masai Mbili before and it was vibrant, it was active, the artists were hanging out and it, the life was there. And it was, I, I felt like it's, a, it's kind of a ghost studio. Most of the artists were not there. And I was asking Butia, where are the artists? Uh, are they not coming anymore? And it was like, there's nothing to do here. People are just at home. And um, it made me really feel that for most of the visual artists, if your space is not shut down, you're either not able to go in there because you don't have the pains to, to work. You don't have people who can come to your spaces. And uh, it's actually really a really sad state. And uh, I was also just talking to Patrick Mukabi and uh, he was telling me that he was at uh, Kuona Trust and the atmosphere there was just very quiet. And just talking to some of my artist friends, you know, I, I was talking to Chalo the other day and we talked for so long. And I felt like he wanted just to talk to someone because for us as visual artists, we like visiting each other. So that, that is not there anymore. And we are wondering what is Patrick doing? What is Zoe doing? What is the other person doing? And it's, it's not a really good state. Most artists are quiet. Some of them are not even answering phones. People are really quiet. Mm. And you can actually feel that there's nothing much going on. Mm. Yeah, sometimes, no, thank you, Maggie. And you know, sometimes that silence can be worrying because you wonder how people are actually doing 
inside. And there's a follow-up question here from um, Melissa Ome, who's a Kenyan student, um, a master's student at the Wits University in South Africa, asking around again, uh, you know, healthy mind. She says, a healthy mind is a catalyst for optimism and innovative thinking. She's saying, is there any support towards overall well-being and mental health of Kenyan artists? Are you aware, Maggie, of anywhere where Kenyan artists, artists in particular, creatives in particular, can go for, for this psychological, emotional support at this time? Yeah. That's a very interesting question because I think for me personally, uh, if I wanted to just relieve myself, I think I would visit an art studio, I would visit an artist, but those spaces are not open anymore or the, the activities are really minimal. And it's maybe something that uh, we need to think about because there are so many young artists out there who are just asking us, how are you coping? How can you help me? And I'm just looking at myself, I'm like, gosh, I also need help. So there are so many of us who need that um, mental health, that emotional health, but we, we've never been in a situation like this. So we've never put structures that can help us uh, in, in, uh, in times like this. So I think those are some of the things that we need to start thinking about. Because when an artist is not able to go to their studio, when they're not able to create, when they we don't have money to buy their artworks, when there's no client who is coming, all that just comes in and start, you, you actually get depressed. And I know there are so many artists out there who are actually feeling that. That depression is actually kicking in. Well, thank you, Maggie. I think Maggie has frozen, but we can, we can keep going. Um, Nelmo, are you there? Nelmo. Yeah. yeah. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Hi, Nelmo. Yeah. So you're, you're sitting in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a different space, but a space that um, is actually a very, a very um, large feature of, of Nairobi which is the informal settlements. And there's a lot of creativity and a lot of creative activity that happens in these spaces. And you yourself, of course, run a festival um, in, in the Mukuru settlements. Uh, I just wonder now, because already, you know, the young people in those spaces, even before COVID, are economically disadvantaged. The opportunities for professional development um, in, in the creative economy is also very much constrained already. How are you seeing things for them now? Are things much worse? And in what ways? What, what is happening in that space? Okay, uh, I, in Mukuru, for example, uh, and uh, most informal settlements have been going around a lot uh, and, uh, since we have been interacting with artists for, for quite a while. Can you hear me? Yes, but a bit louder, if you can. Uh, let me just hold the... <laughs> yeah, that's good, yeah. Yeah, so... Uh, I think the biggest challenge, because uh, it's very different, uh, like how Mulan was saying, uh, for big artists, it's easier because for them, they still make money on streams, they still make money on online concerts. It's very different here because for us, uh, most of the artists here depend on uh, small, small concerts and gigs that uh, they get to get to, to at least earn some, um, some income from. And uh, because I'm, I'm also an event organizer over here, it's hard because uh, we know April was just the other day. And uh, basically, we could not hold any events. Uh, we could not uh, be able to hold any showcase that uh, at least artists can be able to earn something. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, this has hit uh, because then it means now it's completely. Uh, it's different uh, when Modoni says, uh, I cannot, my, my income is 60%. Some of these artists, they depend on art. The little money they make on a weekend or uh, once a month, that's how much they are able to survive on. It's very different uh, uh, from uh, other artists. We have been trying to organize online concerts, uh, which uh, it's not as easy because it's all an, uh, uh, an issue of numbers. Because if uh, it's an upcoming artist who doesn't have enough numbers, it's hard for them to even have someone uh, getting to to donate or send some money through the Mpesa payments. So I think here, it's, it's total lockdown and shutdown uh, on the creative industry on the side of Mukuru and also other, because we have, have been, uh, we've been having conversation also with other artists around the other slums. And uh, basically, it's a shutdown because uh, also we were also having a conversation with Masava. 
Uh, he runs an, an, an art club in um, in South Bay, the Mukuru Art Club. And he was saying for them, they hold uh, monthly uh, art exhibitions, but they can't do that now. Uh, so they, they're even finding ways to be able to look for other ways to be able to pay for their premises. So I think on the on, on such uh, the smaller, smaller platforms for upcoming artists and artists in informal uh, settlements, it's even harder for them uh, on this time, which it's the same. It's the same all across, uh, mostly looking at our Kenyan uh, music industry. I think uh, it's when reality is hitting and get people getting to understand how your uh, online presence is very important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no, thank you for sharing that. Now, George, Heva Fund was very quick to carry out a survey of the effects of um, COVID-19 on the, on the sector. And I think this, this is really an important step that was taken because one of the challenges, of course, is to quickly understand the situation so that we can take the right solutions. Now, I know that the, the document is quite big and there's actually a lot of interesting um, findings and observations within that report. But can you just give us uh, a sense of some of the statistics, some of the information, some of the findings that surprised you um, in, in doing this survey on um, on, on, the, on the effect of, of uh, coronavirus on the sector. Well, thank you, Joy. And thank you, Maggie. Thank you, uh, Mudoni, Nelmo, uh, Martin, for in one way or another articulating um, uh, the reality of this uh, pandemic. Uh, for me, I, I, I sit in a place where I'm both an artist, but I'm also a resource manager for artists. Um, and, and, and easily um, uh, for the 40 companies that we are currently working with, we've been able to extend waivers and some of those waivers are already costing our balance sheet. Uh, for every 21 days, uh, we are losing more than 20 million shillings uh, in, in revenues. And for a small company like ours, I don't know how much loss we can also sustain. My hope is that uh, we can only, we'll, we will start reopening soon so that then um, the degree of loss can be mitigated. However, we were happy um, that uh, over 540 people were able to interact uh, with our survey and with our data collection process. And so far, uh, we are starting to see some things. And I'll just take a couple of uh, interesting statistics here. First one being that uh, this report confirms that uh, it confirms the assumptions that we had. For many people who've been in the sector for more than five years, you realize a majority of um, actors, our peers, our friends um, are independent and they are not affiliated and they are unregistered. So what do I call Pekeao? <laughs> and they are unaffiliated. And so we realized in our report over 60% of people are completely unaffiliated, like uh, they're independent and over 80% are unregistered. So even when we are looking for some sort of help, the question is, what is the immediate ecosystem? Another thing that we realized is that um, people, we indeed have a sector. Most of the respondents uh, of our uh, survey have been in the sector for more than three years. And, they were, and, 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 and also a bigger majority of them uh, have been earning from the sector for more than five years. So, so we have a sector and that was good to see. But, but, but if you look at, um, uh, if you look at uh, all those statistics combined, if you've been in the sector for more than three years, but you're still unaffiliated and an unregistered. So there are many gaps on how to build the ecosystem. Um, we, 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 we are worried really, uh, what the, the, the picture that we start to see is that while many people say the first quarter, which is January, February, March is low season, the impact of the corona pandemic in the low season is quite dire. Um, I'll give you one example. Uh, incomes uh, for more than uh, seventy percent, more than seventy percent of our, our people from across uh, the 
to the value chain, they lost more than 500,000 shillings just in the first quarter. And they're projecting that if this uh, pandemic goes into uh, June, <laughs> we are almost there, they lose us a further uh, potential income of up to 700,000. And this is, this is a, a ballpark figure that in, includes a range. So if you think about someone losing the potential income of about uh, 1.2 million shillings, how do we recover from that? And that is intense. And why it is intense, um, uh, the question is not just the lost income, but when you ask people about the future, uh, people start to say that, there's, uh, that uh, with the cancellations, with the refunds, uh, with, the, with the fewer international travels, with the fewer funds, uh, there are no new jobs. Uh, because they were hoping the reopening will call new jobs, but uh, future jobs are looking more bleak. If you think about the people who have uh, employees, 43% uh, of our respondents had employees. One to 10 employees was a majority number. And of, of these people, uh, most of them are in casual contracts. So we are talking about a whole cross-section of the people who work in the creative industries are casuals. That is more than 80% of, uh, say, the workforce. So, so then we asked, what are you doing with the workers? A lot of them said that uh, because of the increase of costs like transport, like masks, like whatever, like rent and low incomes, they're going to lay off um, majority of their employees. So we are seeing already fragile uh, group of people uh, who work in the creative sector are going to face in the coming month more drastic action. And so to, to end uh, at least the brief findings, we see that majority of the businesses and the workers indicated that the impact of COVID is between high and severe. And when we ask what is high, they said they've lost more than 15% to 50% of their, of their income. And when we ask what is severe, they've lost more than 60% of their uh, incomes. In, in normal business environments, if someone loses over 60% of their income, they close down. So the question is, uh, we have groups of, um, of uh, creative industry practitioners who who have lost more than 60% of their income already. So are there uh, matching uh, facilities that provide relief? And what about those who have lost more than 20%? How do we help them not lose, like Martin said, their inventory, their key skills, their um, experience? And so these are some of the thoughts that this report offers. Finally, we try and create a framework to understand uh, impact because the impact is not uh, uniform across all, all, all subsectors. And so we created this, um, what we call uh, a framework that looks at, let me just, looks at several things. We look at uh, whether the sector requires large gatherings to operate whether the sector requires close uh, human physical uh, interaction, whether it is dependent on travel, whether it's dependent on uh, public grants and expenditure, say government NGOs, whether it depends on international logistics for it to be viable, and how the consumers are responding during the pandemic. And if you look at all these factors, we realize that some sectors like um, live music, theater, dance, DJ performances, uh, live entertainment, weddings, event suppliers, museums, galleries, and cultural heritage practitioners are very highly exposed. And then the rest uh, are in different categorization. So as we start to think about who is a, who's facing most um, pressure, who is in the severe end, who is in the moderate end, and who is in the low end. And so finally, there are those that are actually really enjoying this phase. And, and, and we also hope that those could be models 
on where we could uh, pivot to in the short term uh, as we start to support those who are uh, highly affected. Thank you. No, thank you very much, George. And again, thanks to Hiva for, for that. And I'm sure that there'll be other studies um, already just a more general study. I know that the government has put out the, um, the report on the impact of COVID on households. And we know that this is important to any, um, any economic sector because it is the households who are our markets. These are the spenders and, and the effects on them, of course, are effects on us in the end as well. But I think just listening to, you know, to just that very brief um, uh, a picture that the panelists have drawn so far of the impacts on them personally, on their sectors, on their businesses, and, and, and the research as well, it seems that, that the Kenyan creative economy, which has been steadily on a rise, one, what you describe as a nascent economy, a growing economy, a young economy, is really sitting at a point of peril because some of these impacts are going to be very difficult to recover from, um, not just in terms, of, in, terms of, in terms of money, but in terms of skill loss. When, when people cannot come back to pick up work in this particular sector, it takes us some steps back. But I know that the, the aim of this discussion is to also begin to discover some, some way forward, some solutions and some, some, some ideas, um, some in, innovative actions that people are being forced to take. Because if you think about it, we're now almost two months into the pandemic and you know, people don't sit around waiting for the car to run over them. Once they realize they can roll away, they roll out of the way. So we are finding that people are kind of rolling out of the way in some very interesting um, uh, through, through some very interesting actions. And I'd like us to sort of discuss this in two ways. One is to, is to think about the public support and by public, I mean government support um, and government attention that is coming to the sector at this time. And then to, and then to segue into just the internal uh, sector, sector, sector resilience and sector strategies for survival. Um, and we start by looking at government. And of course, I think inevitably this, this question of the 100, million Kenya shillings that um, the financial relief that uh, His Excellency President Kenyatta gave to artists, um, of course, has engendered many debates. Uh, one could say that it is a double-edged sword in some respects. Um, but before I invite uh, Dr. Lagat to give us an overview of at least the aims of this, if I can call it a stimulus, from the perspective of government, from the perspective of the ministry, Maybe I can ask um, Wanderi Karimi to just respond, give your own personal response, or even a response from, 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 uh, from your institution around what you think uh, this gesture signifies, the gesture of, of giving a, a, a sum of relief to a sector that for a long time has not been given recognition um, or, or attention or even any serious consideration. Um, do you think it signifies anything? Um, what is your thought, Wandeli? So um, I, I think, first of all, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, we, we, I think this is the first time that we've had something like this happen in this country. I think the last time um, we've had anything, any kind of input from government was probably tax relief and in early in the in the late twenty in the late two thousand. So this is a, a very significant gesture, and I think. One of the things I, I have seen with the conservator, for example, we serve a community of about 4,000 people. Um, there's of course been that panic, but then um, immediately that, that announcement came. There was, um, you know, uh, how do we innovatively go ahead and, and, and take advantage of that? So we've seen a lot of collaboration. The Department of Culture, wh where we are hosted is the Kenya Cultural Center. That recording that you just had at the beginning was done as, um, with, with, um, on the Kenya National Theatre stage, which, which of course is something that would not have happened before, <laughs> before this time. So that collaboration and that idea of uh, working with the people in the sector is, is something that we are, we are grateful as, as uh, members of the, of the sector. I think the creativity um, that we are seeing also in how, how people are responding to this. Um, I, 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 we have a community, a community orchestra that, that runs and we've seen a lot of creativity with the young people because the, of course we serve people who are mostly under the age of 30. So there's been a lot of, um, uh, um push to go online and they've been quite 
quite um, open to even having those conversations which we would not have had before because government now is, is a partner, not uh, those guys who we don't like. It's actually looking like um, the sector can now get a boost from that, from that kind of um, collaboration with government. Mm -hmm. No, thank you, Wanderi. Dr. Lagarde, you've heard Wanderi call government a partner. She says government now is a partner. Um, and perhaps from the perspective of the Ministry of, of Sports, Culture and Heritage, you can give us a, a sense of how you saw this money making a difference to artists in this period. And particularly, you know, responding against the, 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 the very dramatic figures that um, the, the, the HIVA uh, report, of course, has revealed, but also the, the um, descriptions of the kind of hardship, economic hardship that everybody is falling into um, at the moment as recounted by the other panelists. <clears throat> what, how, did, how did government see this making a difference? And then is it a one-off gesture or is there a, a plan to have a more systematic planned effort moving forward for the creative economy? I know I've got three questions there for you. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Joy. Uh, I think my fellow panelists have really painted uh, a picture of how severely this uh, COVID-19 has affected them. Indeed, this is a pandemic that has affected all the sectors of the economy. And most of you must be aware by now that uh, the government instituted a raft of measures to cushion various sectors of the economy. There was a total tax relief for persons earning le uh, less than 24,000 Kenya, Kenya shillings. Uh, income tax relief uh, was reduced from 30% uh, to 25% for, for those earning more than uh, 24,000 shillings. Uh, there are things like a reduction of uh, turnover tax from 3% to 1%, a reduction of VAT from uh, 15% to 14%. At that juncture, this important sector that contributes 5, 6, 7% to the GDP was left out. And uh, I think it was thus imperative that uh, the cultural and creative industries are also taken into consideration. Uh, this is a sector uh, that engages uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, the youth and artists in this country. And therefore, when the president made uh, on the 6th of April, when he announced the 100 million shilling stimulus package for artists, I think most of us were very excited because we knew that uh, many, of our, many of our young artists, as well as some of the, some of the experienced artists were actually going through challenges. And therefore, we sat down as a ministry and uh, we considered various options. But given that we have perhaps 100,000 artists in this country, uh, 100 million shillings would really have been a drop in the ocean. I know a number of people expected uh, cash transfers via M-Pesa, but we thought that uh, that would not have had an impact really. And therefore, uh, the Pay for the work for pay program was thus uh, proposed, which is something that we thought would target the most vulnerable, vulnerable artists in the society. And uh, by helping them uh, manage some of the adverse effects, we thought that that would be the best way of doing it while helping us uh, churn out messages on how to stay safe. Uh, while reinforcing some of the World Health Organization recommendations, as well as inspiring hope, uh, empathizing with the way, empathizing with those who've been affected differently by this pandemic, as well as uh, addressing some of the issues of mental health that is affecting a number of them. So I think that was, that is how that, uh, initiative was crafted and uh, it was rolled out or it was launched uh, a week ago, well, about two weeks ago by the cabinet secretary. An announcement was made uh, yesterday by the principal secretary, basically rolling out the criteria uh, on which 
through which artists are to apply for the funding. And uh, it is funding that is targeted at uh, all the domains of uh, the cultural and creative industries. Uh, I think at this juncture, maybe what artists should, uh, should do is to actually visit the website of the sports, of the sports culture and heritage ministry. Uh, basically it is www.sportsheritage.go.ke to see what opportunities exist. And I want to assure you that uh, this actually responds to some of the statistics that have, that have been given to us by George Gashara. For instance, George says that 97% uh, of the cultural and creative sector in this country has been affected. And I think we are addressing some of those challenges. And one of the most uh, important outcomes of George, uh, George of Evers Fund uh, uh, survey is that 80% uh, of artists are not registered anywhere. 61% uh, no, 80% are not registered with any government organization. 61% is not registered with any association. And I think this gives us a challenge because we are, it, it puts us in a difficult position on how we can address some of the issues these artists are facing. And therefore, to me, I think uh, it gives us an opportunity to address some of those, uh, some of those gaps and uh, come up with robust ways in which we can address it. Because that way, once we have the statistics, once artists are registered, it becomes possible to address some of their sector specific issues uh, by knowing uh, who exists, who does what. And uh, I think government without statistics, it becomes really a problem for us to address some of, the, some of those challenges. Uh, the other opportunity that that gives us also is uh, an opportunity to partner with the, the corporate sector as well as the as well as the civil society organizations and i think to me that would be one of the ways to move forward this agenda thank you thank you thank you dr lagat and as you were speaking um the, the 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 chat bar is 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 alive <laughs> and maybe i can just share some of those comments and then see how let's just spend a few minutes in this space because i think one of the things that um the 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 the, the um financial relief that has come from government has done is to if i can put it this way unmask certain challenges that 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 sit in the in the sector um, and these are challenges of, 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 of mechanisms and structures for disbursement. Um, but then I think there's also ideological questions. So let me just share some of, some of the, the comments that, that are coming. Um, so some comments are saying that it seems to say that there seems to be a perceived weakness in the capacity of the actors in the creative economy to convene and organize themselves for collective action so that they can, they can make a case and then make a case and receive money. And then Dan and Yango very specifically of the Hope Raisers um, is, is wondering whether, and this was a question that he sent earlier, so this is the one I'll read, is wondering whether through this method of disbursing money and asking artists to, to use it to message around COVID-19, aren't artists then just being used as tools for government propaganda um, because this financial relief is being tied very specifically to generating messaging for COVID-19? Um, and then I think that uh, there's Tabu Susa who is, um, has been following you as you were talking about the challenge of, uh, of, uh, of, of registries and trying to really identify artists. And let me just find his, um, his uh, thing here very quickly. These things move too fast. Yeah, Tabu suggests that if there is not a proper registry, how about then working with the CMOs to some extent, working with local administration and chiefs, and the Nyumbakumi activities to some extent to identify the artists. In other words, we can find different solutions to identifying who an artist is in order to ensure that the money is dispersed across, across, um, across a wide swathe of the sector. Let me, let me just get some comments on this first, just from some of the other panelists. Uh, Martin, uh, maybe can I hear just from you uh, and then maybe hear from Mudoni before we come back to, to Dr. Lagarde? 
Um, <laughs> Martin, are you there? Yeah. So again, yes. we're speaking very specifically around the challenges that this has opened up. So I don't want us to go into the space of who should get, who should not get, but it has clearly yes. opened up some, some challenges. What are those and how do we begin to mitigate them? Well, um, I think most of the challenges have been addressed by the panelists. Uh, it seems like uh, the challenges uh, span across art, but uh, what, what uh, makes film sort of um, stand out in, in my, uh, from my experience is uh, in film is a, you have uh, multiple disciplines. You have the, the artists, you've got the musicians, you've got all these, the actors, all these guys come together under one, uh, you know, one production called a film production. So what I'm hearing is affecting everyone um, has all come to this one film production thing. Uh, as you said, I will not re I'll not go into details of um, the monies and uh, funding and all that, but I'll just, this is just food for thought before I pass the floor to everyone. Just listening to everyone speak and uh, also having the thoughts myself. When you look at classics like Charlie Chaplin or, or uh, Mr. Bean, what you see in front of the camera is one artist, one, one fellow. And that's the guy we focused on and that's the name, that's the brand we know. When you come behind camera on that set, filming that one person and maybe 30 people across all, all these artistic um, disciplines we've talked about. What I'm seeing happening now is something what thing moving forward, how what's going to change in this COVID time? Are we going to work in those large numbers? How can we remodel the whole filming thing? And um, I can bet that a lot of um, selfie-based equipment that does what we are doing now is about to end up on the, in the, in the film market. Yeah? Um, I don't know if I've answered you or jumped no, way no, ahead you... into how, it... how we're going to change, how are we going to mitigate this right now? What can we do immediately to make, since we cannot congregate in numbers, we cannot travel, we cannot cross borders, we cannot cross River Chania here. What are we going to do to keep us alive, keep our art alive and make money in the process? Yeah, that's, that's fine. I think that, yeah, we can, we can alternate between the solution and, and responding very specifically to this. But I see again on the, on the chat uh, some, some comments um, that, that, that Maggie can probably speak to and add to, but so that we can then have um, uh, Dr. Lagat respond to the challenge that they're facing in trying to identify and disperse uh, money to, to vulnerable artists. So some of the questions I'm seeing on the chat are how do visual artists who aren't muralists, how, how do those ones, because basically the work for pay program, um, you can see that somebody's going to do a mural that has a message, you know, can probably, can probably make an application and, 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 and stand a chance, but not all visual artists are doing that. So how do they benefit from this work for pay program? And then the other question that I'm seeing being asked around this is, is how do we define vulnerable artists? Because we've just heard that from an artist who might not seem vulnerable, a well-known performer, like Mudoni is also very tightly squeezed. Um, a, a film production company that has been operating for 10 years is really at the edge right now. So, and then you have, uh, Nelmo has described how artists in the MTA, basically a large percentage of their money, once they don't have performances, that is the end of it. So everybody is vulnerable. So the question is, how do we decide who is vulnerable? Um, how do we deal with um, those sectors that cannot message uh, as, this, as this fund requires them to message at this particular point in time. Maggie, do you want to say anything to this on behalf of the visual artists? Because I know that sometimes um, the visual artists do get a raw deal in, 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 the, in these discussions. Uh, yes, I'd like to say something because, um, thank you, uh, Dr. Ari Lagat. Um, you know, when I was looking at the, the application uh, for the monies, the way they were uh, being dispersed, especially for the visual artists through uh, National Museums of Kenya, 
one of the criteria was a registered vulnerable visual artist groups. So immediately that's written there. A lot of us are on the side. Yeah, because we are not uh, registered as vulnerable visual artists, but we are all vulnerable, Joy. At this point in time, we are all vulnerable. So what we are asking as visual artists is that whatsoever uh, the National Museum is going to do, because it's very specific, it's murals. And as somebody said, is it, is it uh, about government taking advantage of artists because they want uh, messagings that are probably um, just targeting maybe young artists, you know? And I feel that uh, when money like this is dispersed, what we are supposed, what the, what the government should be doing or what the, the sector should actually be looking at is that what, what is the need of the artist? Even this vulnerable artist, what is their immediate need? Because I, I saw that uh, they're targeting around 450 artists from across board. And we are, we are so many artists, Joy. I think we are, we are more than 10,000 visual artists. And I know uh, maybe they can't feed into all that, but the question is, is making murals very key? Is that really what government wants visual artists to do? Because if you put us on a table, we will tell you what we want you to use that money for. And the key thing will not be to make a mural because once I've made that, that mural, You'll give me some money, I'll probably go and maybe pay rent or do something else. But then what else? Because I've seen someone, uh, I think uh, Kimani Wawanjiro was, was asking, how do we get out of that hole? That money is like something that's removing us out of that hole, but how many people are you removing from that hole? So I think to be really uh, holistic, we need to sit down, yeah? Get key stakeholders and ask them what is really your need? Because seriously, I don't think making murals right now is a great need for visual artists. Okay, thank you. And I, and I think that of course, the, the, the purpose of this discussion is, is to begin to, to find um, uh, and, and, for, and for all of us to hear other ways of, of trying to understand how to work with, I think this very important gesture of, of, um, of a relief for the sector. Um, because I hope, um, and I think we all hope that this will not be a one-off um, uh, disbursement. And if indeed it does not end up becoming a one-off one disbursement, then we need to think about how do we structure um, the, 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 the mechanisms for disbursement in ways that, that respond to people's needs um, and, that, and that work for, for all of us. Dr. Lagat, I will give you a chance to probably just um, respond to some of the things that you, you've heard the artists say. Okay, thank you, Joy. I think I'll respond to three key issues. The first one, I'll start by clarifying something that I think to me is a misconception. It is not that this uh, funding is only targeting neural artists when we come to visual art. We have all the other categories of visual art, photography, cartoonists, mixed media artists. Uh, we have uh, fashion and design, ceramics, drawings, amongst many others. So all of them will be given an opportunity to respond. The mural artists will only work to produce work uh, with the National Museums of Kenya. The National Museums of Kenya is the facilitating institution, but uh, the Department of Culture deals with all the other uh, domains of visual art. Uh, the second question is with regard to vulnerability. I think that is the, the $6 million question in the room. Uh, however, we've also attempted to come up with a criteria on how artists could uh, benefit. One, for instance, is uh, you need to show us your income from art in the last uh, six months. Uh, secondly, a statement of uh, vulnerability. I know that may not be very tight proof, but at least you need to demonstrate to us that you are vulnerable. Uh, you, I know there are artists uh, like comedians, for instance, who are engaged in other meaningful uh, employment. So one ought not to be actively engaged uh, in a different income generating uh, stream. And uh, one other thing is uh, 
you ought not to have been a beneficiary of any other government uh, initiative targeting COVID-19 pandemic. So I think in that case, uh, we, we have parameters that we will use. With regard to the issue that we will be, we are actually out there to use artists, benefit and uh, churn out messages in support of uh, WHO and government uh, recommendations. I think that is not absolutely true because uh, for some of the works, uh, some of the works do not have to be directly related to COVID-19. Uh, you could produce, when we talk of uh, We Are The World, for instance, uh, the 1984 all-time hit, uh, that, that it, it specifically does not address the famine in Ethiopia at that time, but it has continued to be an evergreen song. So their chances are some of the music, some of the artworks that will be produced during this period could be bestsellers, for instance. That's the right, that's the wrong word. Uh, and and uh, <clears throat> the artists will continue from benefiting from IP and uh, copyrights uh, beyond uh, this period. Uh, we hope that by this works online, uh, by allowing some of the maybe paintings, for instance, to, to be exhibited, uh, it could be in a Biennale somewhere after COVID. Uh, if this work is sold, the artist will still benefit. Then finally, uh, I know there's an issue on uh, why it is the government disbursing this funding and not any other private organization, CMO, or, uh, or, or, or uh, collective of artists. The main reason is this funding has come from the Sports, Arts, and Social Development Fund, and they have a criteria. That funding can only be accessed by professional sports people, sports organizations, and government of Kenya entities. So unless uh, the fund regulations are revised, then I think uh, at the moment it becomes difficult for CMOs to apply for that money for an arts collective to apply for that money. Uh, but because of uh, the challenges that we've encountered uh, during this process, I think it also calls for a review of the sports fund uh, regulations in order that it, uh, it responds more robustly to the needs of the cultural and creative industry players. Okay, thank you. And I think, I, I think that again, as I indicated at the beginning, this is not the space to exhaust this um, this particular discussion that is already happening um, outside of this particular forum, and we do need to keep it going. But the idea was to begin to expose some of those challenges and to think about how we build strategies for recovery and for resilience. So I will segue, if you will allow me, in, in the last minutes that we have left, into talking about some of the strategies that we are beginning to see taken um, by practitioners in the sector around that show agility, adaptiveness, resourcefulness, innovation, um, as they try to survive economically and psychologically. And of course, this is uh, being played out predominantly in the, in the digital space. Um, along the sidebar, and I think that we'll be able to save all of the comments that are coming out of the sidebar, and then perhaps the, the, you know, the, the forum will be able to share these more generally with all of the participants, because there's some, I think, very useful uh, inputs that are being made and we cannot cover them all. So thank you for all of those. We are seeing them and we are noting them. Um, but I think that to, to just move into this space of trying to understand how we will recover and where the opportunity sits. And we've, and we've picked up some of the challenges because opportunity also sits in a challenge. Um, Wanderi Karimi, can I ask you to, because you're an IP lawyer um, yeah. and digital has become a lifeline of sorts. You've seen particularly musicians, uh, you, you know, beginning to work this space and to try and see how it is a space that of course is bringing light and cheer to our hearts, but also hopefully trying to see how they can monetize in this time of COVID as well. What, what springs to mind for you as an IP with your IP hat on now around this space becoming more alive and what sorts of things should we be aware of as practitioners in the creative economy moving forward? 
Um, thanks, thanks, Jeff, for the question. So in uh, IP, a lot of people right now are just trying to survive. And I think, um, I mean, songs that bring, I'll tell you like from the musicians that I know are doing a lot of covers and, and things. So you will not be able to monetize, for example, your covers if you put them up on YouTube. But um, creating content that is, um, of course, original is, is really important because then um, with only with original contact, con content will you be able on all platforms to to make any revenue in that in that sense. But also the other thing that I that 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 and I think the concern has been has been brought out even in the question is um, I think there needs to be a clear a clear uh, guideline on what that IP whatever IP um, will be what happens to the IP for the for the people who participate in this program um, for the conservatoire a lot of um, one of the things that one of our partners has done is that they're giving um, free, free, so they make make music available for free for for the day because to bring light. So those are some of the things also that that people might might decide to go um, the the copy left um, uh, direction to Creative Commons and allowing people to use um, the music not necessarily for for uh, profit, but but you know to share to share in the music as you are saying um, that that is bringing light but with the intention that um, when we get out of this, that the, the structure that you have um, gathered with this, with a very clear, um, whatever it is you're putting out online on where, whether it is a cover or not, that you put that it is a cover so that you don't get caught up, of course, in, in those, those kinds of um, conflicts that we see around IP. Because you, um, when, when you have conflicts over who is going to make what, then it doesn't matter how much money the government gives us. You're 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 going to to be in a space where you're 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 in conflict for the work that you've created, and you create another problem that you shouldn't you shouldn't be dealing with. So clarity in in who wants what, um, whether whether uh, the program is for government or not, and and being able to create um, content that you decide whether you're going to um, get money out of it or um also share with the world and then use that as your premium to make make some money going forward mm -hmm. and in fact you yeah. you you do reinforce or something that i see again on the chat bar from june gashui who is also an ip yeah. lawyer who is saying yeah. that the issue of ip is not on any of the documentation that has been shared so far um to artists mm -hmm. around their own submissions so again, you know, that I think that's something that that needs to be picked up by those who are calling in for submissions, but also the creators yeah. themselves to be aware of of the kinds of protections that they need to be thinking about in this regard at this time. Um, Mudoni, um, so now, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I was just going to add there's, there's currently a bill in Parliament to to consolidate the, the IP. Um, uh, this is Kitty, this is patent. Uh, trademark copyright. So there is a process right now. We just we just um, amended the current co corporate act, but then there is there is a move to have the bill um, consolidate all these acts together so that you can have one one place. So there there, are, there is movement to uh, um, that government is making towards making um, some of these places accessible. And of course, there is a copyright tribunal where people, if they do have disputes, they can bring them um, to the copyright tribunal, which I sit on. And you can get that information off the judiciary website. Thank you, Wanderi. So Mudoni, as we as we sort of come to close to wrapping up, maybe you can lift us up a little bit by sharing some of the things that you think are exciting um, opportunities, new ways, different ways, expanded opportunities um, for for the use of of, um, of 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 the online of the digital. Uh, by artists, by musicians, um, or any other sorts of artists that you're seeing, and what that what that might um, flag for the future. Thanks, Joy. Um, so I, I I have a very I, I know you want me to lift you up, but uh, I have a very <laughs> mixed uh, I have a very mixed I have a very mixed approach to this. I think the internet is really working for those who have access. Mm. And for audiences that have access, I think now more than ever, the disparities that naturally exist within the entertainment industry, particularly music, uh, now are becoming very, uh, very apparent. I mean, um, like Nelmo just said um, a, a few minutes ago, whereas, you know, I have access to 
gear and uh, lighting and whatever I need to put on a production in the luxury of my home, majority of artists don't have that. Mm -hmm. um, and so I know <laughs> there's this thing that we want to feel good, like, man, the internet is going to be the next frontier. I just want to say that as much as it is the next frontier, it's going to leave a lot of people behind unless there's a deliberate sort of this cognition at, the, at a policy level that internet must now become a, a basic and free good because it's a question of access to information. Um, and I know it sounds radical, but I don't know what really is radical um, about making a version of internet accessible. And I know there's private players, people like Brick who you know, uh, work to make the internet more and more accessible um, for lower units at a community level, but that's just a real thing. The, um, what the internet has done, at least for musicians, and I want to say again in, the, in our sector, musicians, music is always the lowest hanging fruit. Mm. Um, so we are always the first ones to respond quickly. It's the easiest, really it's the easiest of the arts. Um, as difficult as it is, it really is the easiest. And I, I think that what it's allowed us to do is to create. So we who can, we who have access, have been able to um, continue and perhaps even unlock a new degree of creativity. So because it's DIY, you have to figure it out. So whether you're going live, how to make your life distinguish itself from the other person's uh, going live, how to work remotely um, with, uh, with other creatives, other producers, other music uh, songwriters. So it's been an intensely creative period of time for musicians. And I mean this globally, but I would like to put a very big caveat there that this thing is a demonstration of privilege. Mm. majority of artists cannot do this sculptors just can't get onto the internet and show you their sculpting for the next three months before they end up with a piece so um whereas the internet is at the same time i've also you know uh been working with uh people who work in gaming engines and set designers and and just seeing how far we can push the tech and how we are about to flip this thing as far as live music production is concerned um, but it's really genuinely, it is a very poor measure of um, a solution for the, for the creative sector at large. It's a, and even for musicians, it's a very poor measure. It's only good for those who can afford it and for audiences that can afford it. Now, um, I think it's really great that in this conversation, we have so many industry leaders and we also have government, uh, 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 Director Lagat. I think this is a really important thing that as government is thinking now, I think the government has gotten 106 billion loan from the World Bank. I think the understanding here is because this thing is long view, there is no recovery that is not going to require a number of years. Um, I'm really grateful that we have the beginning, 100 million, and I even really like this idea of work for pay. I think it's the only, because Kenya is Kenya, I think this is genuinely the only verifiable <laughs> mechanism for people to do some work and get some pay. It obviously ignores the basics, which is between now and when I make the work, how do I pay my rent and how do I eat, you know, how do I eat tonight before I make the mural in a week from now. So there's this, there's this problem. Uh, but I think that we have to have a longer view, uh, uh, Director Lagat. There has to be, in the same way government is now thinking, what is the, what is the 18 month support that needs to be given, for example, to, to farming? Right? What is the, well, how do you support this thing for 18 months before it's able to get back on its feet? There has to be a question, how do you support creativity and not so much support as much as stimulate? So you're going to need to drop a whole lot of money over a period of time to stimulate, um, uh, uh, to keep artists creating, but there also has to be a supply stimulus, right? So if artists are creating all these amazing works, but people are too broke to, by airtime to watch your amazing concert that you worked on for three months, it's 0, 0.0. So I think there's a question about the demand. So this stimulus, I really see it as a demand stimulus and I, I love it. It's a great place to start. Um, but there has to be thinking about also the supply on the, so we, you've saw, sorry, you've solved for supply in the interim. Now you need to think about demand. How do you, how do we get the demand to be you know, up and going. And then we also have to have a longer view. Um, 
So I'm sorry, Joy, it's not as uplifting <laughs> as you'd like it to be, but I do, I, 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 I do think that there is a true opportunity here for innovation. All of us are going to have to redesign this thing. We're going to have to bring products to the market for the consumers who can still afford. I think there's also the understanding of now we are on a, we are on a global scale. So I've seen a lot of cooperation and artists who would never be available you know, now just being like, oh yeah, I'd like to read that script you sent, or can we work on this sketch together? There's a genuine feeling for, okay, let's work. And I think a lot of that has to do with, for the first time in months, you're not grinding, you're not off running off on your whatever project. So that's really great. And um, the last point I want to make to, to in this statement, um, I, and I, I want to say this to uh, Martin and to, to to, to, to companies. I'm going to sound like a capitalist right now, but I'm going to say in every crisis, there's plenty of money that's walking around. It's the nature of capitalists. There's a lot of people who have money. I know we've been approached already twice. Uh, do you need some money? Do you want us to invest in the business? Are you ready to? So I would say that uh, June is upon us. So first get your tax, uh, just get your tax house in order, get your returns in order, make a dope swanky presentation and, uh, and, and start and, 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 and actively put yourself out there. There is a lot of venture capital. There's a lot of capitalists who are looking to take over people's businesses that are going to be crashing. The logic there is wait until we are desperate. Um, so I would hope that you don't get to the place that is desperate, Martin, but maybe uh, to think strategically about um, taking on equity partners, um, which may be a bit uncomfortable in the interim, especially when you have a great super, a super team that you took 10 years to build, you know. Um, so maybe the, the business is going to have to take some else to maintain your super team because you can't lose your resource. You're never going to get it back. Uh, but then on the other side, aggressively looking for ways to bring capital in. And especially if the businesses, if the artworks have been good businesses, if your business has been a good viable business over the years, there's a lot of venture capital that's walking around trying to, you know, buy your, uh, your entity at a song. If your entity is great, they won't buy it at a song. They will just end up putting some money in. Um, that's me. <laughs> Those are my thoughts. <laughs> thank you, no, thank you Muthoni. And I think you, you bring us to, to sort of a, a, a good end. We're now sitting at um, 5.33. And I know that we had said we'd finish by 5.30. I think the good news, folks, is that this uh, Resilient Forum is, is just the first one. And the idea is for these conversations to continue. And so the organizers of this particular forum will be letting you know, um, I think within, within the coming month, there'll be another discussion. But just to summarize um, some of the issues, it seems, because I think, um, Mudoni, it, you did lift. I think everybody lifted because for me, where you, where you identify a problem, you are, that is the first step to a solution. And I think that we have clearly articulated certain things. And if I can just repeat them, I think from the very beginning, one of the things we talked about, a sector that is challenged to build reserves. If you don't have a safety net, when the big wind comes, you're in trouble. So that is something to think about. I think we also talked about a sector that does not have social and emotional support in a time of crisis. Where are these spaces and how can we put this as part of the structure? We also then recognize that the ecosystem itself, the structures themselves are shaky. So in other words, we do not have a, a solidity around collective voice, collective action, and even mechanisms of receiving and distributing um, relief, uh, relief money. The other thing that seems to have come up is just that we are challenged to define artists and, and creative work um, and, and therefore to identify them. And I think this comes back to the whole question of policy. There's a whole statute around the status of the artist and the definition of the artist, which I think it's time the Kenya government now seriously uh, took on board and began to define its sector. Uh, the other thing that has come up is a serious review of a a source of resource for, for the sector, which is the sports, um, uh, uh, arts and social protection fund, which in its very structure completely disables the ability of the sector to, to receive money. So that is very weird. How do you have arts within there? And yet within the way that that is structured, you cannot receive the money. So that is a problem. But then the other things we've recognized that even as we've been forced to come digital, digital access is not equal and that we need to really think as a government, as a society about digital being a public free good for everybody because that is the future and that is the way that we are moving. And then I think finally we talked about the fact that this is 
about the long view. This is not about now. In a crisis, there's the immediate action, and then there is trying to get out of it. And these conversations are part of trying to get out of it. So I think that we've identified um, the beginning of some of the questions that are part of the solution moving forward. And to close, I'd just like the, each panelist to sort of say, what do you think presses, is, is presses you first? Where do you think, um, what difference would you like to see in the sector post COVID? Just very briefly, one word or a phrase, and how, what action do you think needs to be taken to realize this? Because this is something that we'd ask the, the panelists to prepare. Just so, we, so we'll just take it through and I'll start with, I'll start with um, Maggie. If Maggie's still with us. Um, <laughs> um, I think for me, uh, just uh, hearing what people have been uh, saying, and especially uh, Dr. Lagat, I think for me, I'd just like to encourage artists to register because government doesn't recognize uh, individual artists working in their own studios. So I would like, I'd like the, the relevant institutions to just make this registration online so that we can see how to work effectively. Thank so you. A recognition of artists in some way. So that, yeah. Yes. Um, Martin, Martin Munua. Is Martin with us? Yes, I'm trying to unmute my audio. There we go. Ah, there go. Yeah. Yes. Um, Thank you very much, everyone. It's been a very healthy discussion. I think I've learned a lot. Um, I liked uh, Mudoni's reference to the DIY, just what I referred to earlier, that um, we we'll end up being uh, self selfie filmmakers, for lack of a better word. And um, if that's the case moving forward post COVID, what I what I would like to see is um, some. Uh, energy put into video on demand platforms with instant monetization. And I'm sure there's a way that this can be done. So if someone posts his uh, three minute clip or something, they, they get instant returns. And this is somewhere where you can see actually government work in terms of policy come together with some form of um, funds that sit somewhere respond to the instant uh, monetization of uh, the clips that go online. And uh, I know the money will, there's a lot of money to be made back. Thank you. Thank I, you. Nelmo? I don't know that no, that's good. Nelmo, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Yes. Uh, for me, I just think uh, wholesomely, we need to, to find ways and uh, working with the government to be able to just make sure we grow the creative sector. Because uh, the truth is, I think it's only now that we're having these kind of discussions uh, because the COVID is here and, uh, you know, initially it seemed like artists were all okay before the whole thing happened. Uh, and the sector, we have, we, have not, we have not felt that kind of support. And if you look at this, if you compare with the other developed countries, there have been more support on artists and not deciding you're doing COVID work, you're not doing COVID work, but respecting artist work because if, if People will, will be artists despite uh, all this. And moving forward, I think the most important thing is that uh, just have an integrated way of moving forward, uh, supporting and uh, putting mechanism, not even supporting. The 100 M, I don't think it's anything that, uh, I don't think it will even make such, such impact if only systems were put in place to make sure that artists get to earn from their work and uh, there is um, as much exposure to artists' work for them to be able to make sure that they earn. That's all I'll say for now. Thank you. Wanderi. For us, collaboration for sure is, is something that we've seen works. I think not, not just with um, the people people here, I mean government, but people within within the sector and even internationally. I think one of the the um, when when I speak to one of our friends that we dance into space, a lot of us are doing our, our things all in our little spaces, but we, if we get together, like what, what um, Hila has been able to do with their report, what the Godown is doing with their spaces, um, if we collaborate, we'll be able to have these conversations with such, uh, with more force and, with, and, and the ideas in the room will definitely make whatever it is that we decide will be uh, our new normal, um, a, a much better space, just not, not only for the creative, but even for our audiences, because we do have a responsibility to them too. Thank you. George? George Gashara? 
Yes, thank you. Thank you, Joy. Um, I'm listening to all these conversations and I, I am inspired that uh, um, we, we are coming to more or less very clear um, areas of agreement. Uh, the question is whether we are able to take them forward and whether we're able to exploit this crisis and not let it go to waste uh, by fixing some of these things that we've complained about for, um, for, a, for quite a while. And I'm glad that uh, we have good people at the ministry um, who are willing to push the envelope uh, right now. I'd like to say three things that um, from where I sit um, are the things that I'm taking on. The first thing is um, support for cultural and creative businesses. This is something that we've done uh, before and we continue to create a model um, around which to support businesses technically and also financially. So we've requested our investors and, um, and our board to allow us to use the resources that we already have uh, to, to, to on land in better terms to uh, the creative industry. So in the next uh, two or three weeks, uh, once we are able to get the relevant approvals, we'll be able to put a, to announce um, a business rescue facility for businesses, uh, not for individuals. And we hope that we can match what the government has put out so that at least we can, uh, we can, we can make our own contributions uh, for creative businesses. So that then we can, uh, we don't just ask, but we also can put a contribution. The second thing that I'd like to say is that um, uh, we, are, we are very excited about the move that the government has had. All factors held constant. Uh, it's one of the few uh, stimulus projects that is in the continent. So that's quite something. And we want to appreciate that all factors held constant. But it also is important for people who have access to networks, uh, to conversations, to start creating other solutions, because this is how our sector has been. We've never only relied on government. We always uh, save ourselves despite government. So this is also time for us to uh, support initiatives. I've spoken to uh, Jun Gashui, I've spoken to Danda, I've spoken to Eric Wainaina, I've spoken to a lot of um, leading lights in the country who are thinking about creating um, a project here, a stimulus there. And so as HIVA, we are offering our, our staff and our resources, uh, the non-financial resources and our networks to help put together uh, and support these initiatives so that there can be something that we match because, because the creative sector has always sustained itself. But now it's time uh, to take the radical decisions to stabilize our, our represent, sector representation and so on and so forth. Um, finally, and what is important is that uh, in the next month or so, we'll see every other sector coming together, uh, whether it's tourism, whether it's uh, agriculture, uh, coming together and saying these are the economic recovery priorities for us. Uh, I've been in conversations where the tourism people are talking about X package, the, the, the transport people, the aviation people. It's time for us to consider what is our priority um, uh, raft of, uh, of, 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 of legal, fiscal, uh, administrative recommendations that we can say this would help a big cross-section of artists if implemented. So that as, as the Uhuru government uh, looks to support the reopening of economy, that we are on the table. Unfortunately, many times we are not co cohesive or consistent. And so I am happy to contribute to any conversation uh, that brings together um, that kind of uh, uh, knowledge and, 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 and to push it forward. Um, but most importantly- okay, George. I'm going to I'm going to have to wrap you up. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you, George. Dr. Lagat. Dr. Lagat. Have we lost him? 
He's muted. Dr. Lagat, you're muted. Okay, I think I'm okay now. Okay, there you go. Yes. I think I'll vote, I'll vote for enhanced uh, collaboration and partnerships between the different players in the sector with a view to crafting and reshaping the cultural and creative industries going forward. And perhaps the last, and, and uh, towards, towards that end, the ministry is very open to continue engaging with the sector. And I'm very proud to say that in the last, in the last couple of months, uh, we've had very robust engagements across the board. Then finally, having, uh, <clears throat> having identified registration as one of the major challenges, I want to inform these panelists that uh, when the cabinet secretary was unveiling this uh, stimulus uh, program, she actually issued a directive that for the next three months, the Department of Culture registers uh, artists and cultural practitioners free of charge as we look for other innovative ways to reach out to all the artists across the board. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you all very much indeed. I'd like to thank the panelists. Thank you, Mudoni, who, who kickstarted this, this end uh, conversation and, and ideas. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Lagat, George, Maggie, Martin, Nell Moore, uh, Wanderi and who else have I left out? I think that's 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 all of you. Um, just to let you know that the next Resiliat is um, programmed for another to come in, in in the next month. So look out for it. Um, and to thank UNESCO for starting this platform, and of course to thank all of the partners who have joined in. But thank you all of the attendees also for coming on board. Somebody has said that they hope that the chat bar on the side will be made available to all of the attendees. I'm sure they will try to do that because there's been some wonderful discussions also happening on the side as well. So Asanteni, thank you all very much. This is just the beginning. We will keep the conversations going. Thank you and goodbye. Asita, are you there? Okay.